Good afternoon. This is Robbie Wilbur with the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. We're glad that you joined us today for this webinar. Uh, Lighting Retrofit Solutions, our presenter is Stan Wallercheck, and uh, he will be speaking to us in just a moment. Um, this presentation today is brought, by, brought to you by the Enhanced Program at the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. Um, ah, there we go, the right slide. Uh, the Enhanced Program is our voluntary environmental stewardship program here at the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, we encourage you, if you're not a member, to join, to check us out. Uh, you can see there, you can contact me or Chris Messamore here at MDEQ. You can go to our website, which is enhanced.ms, and find information about the program and also how to apply. The membership period runs from July 1 until September 30. So uh, we encourage you to check it out and, uh, and join the program if you're interested. Um, just a little housekeeping here. All of your participants are muted. Uh, you can choose to use the mic and speaker, or you can use telephone uh, using the, the number that was provided to you. Also, you can submit your comments um, and questions with the question box, and we'll collect those, and Stan will answer those at the end of the session. We will also send you a copy of this workshop to, any, to everybody that's registered uh, within a week, and then we'll also um, put a recording of this, this webinar on YouTube, on the DEQ YouTube channel. Let me go ahead and uh, we'll turn this over to Stan and he can start uh, the presentation. Greetings everybody and we will get started. Okay, so yes, so I'm going to be speaking for about 45 or 50 minutes and then we'll have Q&A at the end and comments. Some of the slides I will go through quite quickly because you will get them. There'll be an appendix I will not be able to get to today in, in today's time frame, but you will get the appendix when, when you are sent a whole PDF. So we're going to be talking about no cost, low cost, and higher cost lighting retrofit solutions. So this is my bio. You can look at this later, but I do have 26 years of experience and I've done almost everything, including working for distribution, a lighting retrofit contractor, consultant, um, et cetera. Again, please write your questions down and we'll get those at the end. Now, I will, you will be also get, be getting a glossary and acronym list, uh, which may help you well, when you get the rest of, of this file as well. And like all my classes, I'm not trying to endorse anything or anybody, but I will mention specific products, um, and you can check out their performance, their lumens, lumens per watt, anything that's the same or better would also be high performance. But again, I'm not trying to endorse anything. Rebate providers, um, as you pretty well know these are your rebate providers depending on the area that you are in. Let's first of all, let's get to positive cash flow financing because this can make almost anything no or low cost. I mean, a lot of times people say, I want to do a retrofit, but I don't have the money. And I'm saying you do have the money. You're just paying the utility too much every month. So split up that money. For example, let's say you or your clients are paying $1,000 per month for electricity. Okay, you do a lighting retrofit, you get it down to $600 per month. $200 would go to the finance company every month. The other $200 would be the income with no out-of-pocket money. And then uh, when the project is paid for, the, the client or the end user can get all of that $400. You can get money from a bank, a finance company, ESCO utility, et cetera. And this is actually a program that you have in Mississippi through the Mississippi Development Authority Energy Loan Program, you know, which looks very good as well. So there's really no good reasons to, to not to do lighting retrofits these days. 
So we're going to focus on no cost. And this is what I'll spend the most time on, and the other ones I'll try I'll probably have to go faster. So, but these will include maybe minor costs, like um, if you're delamping, um, it's proper to do lamp recycling, and there's a small cost for that. Labor, even if it's done in house, but again, these are these are almost minuscule most of the time. One way that it's so good to save money, a lot of places are overlit. A lot of office buildings designed before 1985 were designed when paper tasks were the main tasks, and you needed a lot of light to do that. Now, as you all know, the main task is computer tasks with self-illuminated screens. And usually less light is better because there's less glare. So the IES used to recommend up to 100 foot candles. Now it's down to, to 30 foot candles. So, you, you know, this is a great opportunity to de-lamp and get down to proper light levels. A lot of people think more light is better. That is not always the case. And again, the MDEQ can loan light meters, which can be a big help. So, and again, probably one of the easiest ways to re, um, reduce light level is, is the lamping. But sometimes you might not reduce the light levels as much as you think. For example, let's say you have a two by four trough or, or a four foot wrap around. You go from four lamps to two. You think, oh, I'm going to only have half of my light. That is really not the case. Um, you might only lose a third um, of the light. And there's some reasons for that which we will um, discuss. Fluorescent T12s and full wattage T8s have optimal light output at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. That's in the air chamber right next to the lamp in the fixture. Okay, now if you have three or four of these lamps in a lens fixture that's not an air handler, you let it run for about an hour, it's going to be close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And just going from 77 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to lose 20%. But if you reduce the number of lamps, the lamps will run closer to their optimal temperature. You won't lose as much light. Also, um, there's also the photometrics. If you have lamps next to each other, like in a two by four tropper, where you have lamp, lamp, ballast cover, lamp, lamp, and a four lamp fixture, you're going to lose a lot of light from one lamp shining light into the adjacent lamp or hitting the reflective surface and then hitting the other lamp. And if, and if you, can reduce the number of lamps, you can improve the fixture efficiency. And basically, every time a light ray hits something and bounces off, you're going to lose about 10%. And this is not just for troppers and regular wraps, but also for quarter wraps, strips, vapor types, hooded industrial, almost every time that the lamps are almost touching each other or very close. So, you know, here's an example, like on the bottom is, is a two by four tropper with four lamps. Um, and you can even look in the lamp catalog and they'll give you fixture efficiency for the same fixture with four, three or two lamps. And the fixture manufacturers will even state that the fixture efficiency improves as there's fewer lamps in the fixture. And on the right-hand side is a typical strip fixture with the lamps almost touching each other. It's usually very easy to de-lamp, just use the right or the left-hand side. But we do have to be aware of the ballast and how that's going to affect de-lamping. If you have, um, there's basically series wired and parallel wired ballast. Most T12 ballasts are magnetic and are series wired, and usually only one or two lamps. And if they're series wired, you can't de-lamp. If you take one lamp out, the other lamp will, will either totally turn off or get very dim. So 
So you um, so let's say you have a two by four tropper with four T12s and two magnetic ballast. Um, you you could use the one two lamp ballast for two lamps. You might need to change the wiring so it's on both the lamps are on opposite sides of the fixture, but you you could still do it. Now, if you have existing T8 and T8 ballast, most of those are parallel wired. So you can remove one or more lamps and the rest will keep working. But you have to understand that ballast factor, which is like stepping on your gas pedal in your car, the, um, the faster you go with, with stepping on the gas pedal, higher ballast factor, more light, more wattage. So let's say you have a a two lamp 0.88 ballast factor generic electronic ballast with two T8 32 watters, the wattage is going to be 59 watts for that system. You take one lamp out, the ballast factor goes up to about 1.0, and, and the wattage is not cut in half. It only goes to about 35 watts. You also need to check if the ballasts are going to be UL listed if you delamp more than one. For example, some ballasts are only UL listed, let's say a four lamp or down to three lamps. It might not be UL from four lamps to two, but you can check. Now, just like some of the magnetic ballasts, some of the rapid and programmed star T8 ballasts are series wired. So you cannot de lamp if you remove one lamp, the other lamp either gets total, you know, very dim or totally turns off. And you can just look at the wiring diagram on the ballast label um, or check with the manufacturer. So here are some projects that were done, you know, in Mississippi, you know, that, that were very good delamping projects. Um, you know, like here, here's one that over 1,300 lamps were removed in two buildings, saving 115,000 kWh per year or $10,000 per year. Um, you know, that's really amazing. Here's some other things you could do. Um, if you have rows of end-to-end -end fixtures, and again, usually when you see end-to-end, -end, it's not the most efficient system. You can usually like gut or remove every other fixture. Now, if the power is going through the fixtures, you might not want to remove it uh, because you'll have to change the, the wiring. Um, also, unnecessary fixtures. For example, in a typical office area, open office, Fixtures are usually in an eight by 10 foot grid pattern. But if you look at the office modules, they're not set up that way. A lot of times it's very cost effective to remove fixtures that are close to the windows over the minor hallways. And you might just wanna have fixtures over the middle of every office module. Um, so that is a, a really a great way to save energy as well. Another thing, turn the lights off. Um, a lot of times you don't need to go with occupancy sensors or other things. Uh, sometimes manual control is the best control. Um, and sometimes you can help people by getting stickers that go over the light switches to remind people when they leave, turn the lights off. Or in a company, it could maybe be a quarterly email you know, saying, please turn the lights off when you leave. A lot of times this education and motivation can be much more cost effective than buying occupancy sensors and installing them. If there is sufficient daylight, the lights can be turned off, you know, um, as well. And let's say there's a place with inboard outboard switching, like a three lamp tropper that has one switch for the middle lamp and another switch for the outboard lamps. 
if you're doing computer work or other people are doing computer work, you may only need the middle lamp on, so there's no sense to have all three lamps on. A similar situation when there are four lamps in the fixture and two can be on and two can be off. So this is going back to that same um, Jackson office buildings we briefly discussed before. Um, Mary Jean told me that they're real, in certain areas they really didn't have light switches and the lights were left on 24-7. Um, there was no accessible way. They, I think they had to go back to the breakers or whatever to do it. So they did install switches. They didn't even have to go to sensors. Just giving people switches really turned off and, and those same decals were installed on, on the cover plates of the switches, which did a great job, you know, and there's a photo of it um, on, on the bottom. So that's really the no-cost solutions. Um, and sometimes no-cost is going to be the best, but sometimes low-cost and sometimes even higher-cost is going to provide the best long-term solutions especially if you can finance the project. So let's say you, you do a no cost now with the lamping. Well, let's say those lamps burn out, or as you know, the production of most T12 lamps have been eliminated. You can still get some of these from China or whatever, but most of the T12s are really hard to find unless you get the expensive ones with high CRI, et cetera. Um, and even with 32 watt T8s, you could go to the reduced wattage T8s, like the 28 or the 25 watt version. They have optimal light output at 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have a small enclosed fixture, like let's say a seal type fixture, um, they might be better than a 32 water um, just because that heat is going to stay in there, they're going to do better. But be aware with the 25 and 28 watt uh, reduced wattage T8, they do not always work with some of the older electronic ballasts. Um, they also are not designed to work below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have open strip fixtures in a multi-level covered garage that's above ground in the winter time um, if they're turned off during the day and are turned back on when it starts to get dark in the middle of the winter um, even in Mississippi they might not work very well now let's look at ballast typical ballast are rated for 60,000 hours um, Basically, that's usually considered to be 15 years. And this is just like fluorescent lamps. It's the middle of a bell-shaped curve when half are burned out and half are still working. And even if you or your clients have fluorescent T8s, but they have generic electronic ballast, you might want to go with high-performance electronic ballast. The, the high performance ones only cost one to five dollars more, but over their rated life, um, with, and they're going to say between three and six watts compared to their generic equivalent, but over their rated life, that's going to turn out to maybe be about twenty five dollars. Um, so that's a great deal. Let's say you spend three extra bucks initially, but that turns into a twenty five dollar saving. You can't do better than that. Uh, as you probably know, you can go to the Consortium of Energy Efficiency uh, to figure out their high-performance lamps and their high-performance ballast. You may only be able to get rebates if they're CEE approved. Now, let's say existing T8 electronic ballasts fail or you want to do a group, um, or group reballasting. This would be a great time to go with high performance electronic ballast, unless you want to go with, with LED. And that's going to be more of the higher 
cost versions. So here's a table that can help you compare fluorescent T8s even a little bit with T5 and T5HOs on the bottom. The ones with the yellow background are the highest lumen 32 watt T8. And you can see GE, Phillips, and Sylvania all have them. And then you, um, with the aqua background are the extra long life 32 waters. And this is pretty amazing. Let's compare the Sylvania XPS and the Sylvania XPXL. The XPS is the highest lumen at 3,100 lumens, and the XPXL is the extra long life. And in the fluorescent world, you can have the longest life or the most lumens, but you can't have both. So if you have the most lumens, your life is going to suffer. If you have the most life, your lumens are going to suffer a little bit. But sometimes it's still good to go with the extra long life especially in applications where maintenance is difficult. So between these two lamps, you can see that the, um, the extra long life lamp has 150 fewer lumens, but let's go to the lamp life hours, the four columns on the right-hand side. And let's really go to program start ballast at 12 hour cycles, which is the one on the far right. The XPS, has 42,000 hour rating, but the XPXL has 67,000 hours, which is 25,000 more hours. And 67,000 hours is actually more rated life than a lot of LED products. So a lot of people say go to LED for the longest life. That is not always the case. And if you go down a little bit further, the next bar down, below that last aqua one is the 28 um, water, like from GE and whatever, that some of these lamps are rated for 84,000 hours, and a Philips is even 90,000 hours. Uh, again, that's longer than a lot of LEDs, and these lamps only might cost 4 or $5, a lot less than LED T8, et cetera. So here's another table that I think you might find of, of interest in the fluorescent world. Let's look at the, at the cells with the yellow background. Um, let's go to column B. You can find initial uh, lumens in a lamp catalog. You can also see the lamp watt in a lamp catalog. You can do some simple division, and D, you can get lamp lumens per lamp watt. What's the highest here? Well, I see the 26 watt T5 is 111.5. What's the best T8? It's the 28 water at 98.2. The, the highest performance 32 watt T8 is only 96.9. But there's a fallacy here, and a lot of people don't know that. That's because the full wattage T8 or started and are still tested with a reference magnetic ballast, where the newer reduced wattage T8s, the T5, the T5HOs are tested with a reference electronic ballast, which gives them an artificial advantage. So the rest of this table, I, I, I use two lamps. You could do it with one, three, or four, and I'm comparing apples to apples with high performance electronic ballast for everything. Okay, now what's the best? Let's look at column M and N, the ones on the right hand side. Let's first go at M, the best lumens per watt. Now what is the best? It's not the 28 watt T8, it's not the T5, it is the 32 watt T8. So that's what I consider the workhorse lamp. And you can see that the T5 is, is really not that good. And you can also look at T5HOs, which are really pretty terrible. That's why I almost never use T5HO lamps. So here's a table that puts various T8s, 25, 28, 
30 watt, 32 watt TAs with various ballast factors and types of ballast. So on the left hand side, you have the ballast factors all the way from 0.6 to 1.2. And we have one to four lamp. And then we have generic instant start ballast as, as sort of a group of vertical columns. And then we have extra efficient instant start ballast, extra efficient program start ballast, and then generic electronic ballast, rapid starter program start on the far right hand side. And so this can really help you determine, you know, the wattage that you're going to get. Because a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to go with the 28 watt lamp compared to a 32 watt, or I'm going to save four watts. No, if you include the ballast, you might only be saving basically three watts, not four watts um, in, in the system. So this might be able to help you. So let's look at LED T8, also called TLED. Some of these are designed to work with your existing fluorescent T8 ballast. Two examples are the Cree T8 um, series and the Philips Instant Start. But beware that Cree just had a recall on 700,000 of, of their T LEDs because they had a, a fire potential, a potential fire problem. But that will get resolved. Now, so if, but if, if the ballasts are old, like let's say the ballasts are older than five years old, um, you might want to also replace ballast, but I've heard certain people say that um, ballast life might actually be better with T LEDs compared to fluorescent T8. I'm not sure about that. Uh, these might cost twelve to twenty dollars depending on quantity, etc. Uh, but this is something that you could consider. Uh, you could you could check locally if you can get rebates for them. Some rebate providers will give rebates, some will not. Um, you know, check that out. Okay, omnidirectional screw-ins. Um, if you still have incandescent, you, you could go with CFL. You, a lot of times you can go to a big box store and you can get like four for a buck or 25 cents each. It's usually an upstream rebate at the store. Um, you may, you know, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, but if you still have incandescents or CFLs, you could go with screw in LEDs, which is like on the one on the right hand side. Now you can go to big box stores and you can get these for as low as four dollars. I mean, I was at one Home Depot and I saw the Cree ones at three dollars and ninety-seven cents. And now, if you already have CFLs, you're not going to save that much wattage. Let's say there's a 15 watt CFL, you could go to a nine watt LED. You're not going to be saving that much in electricity, but the rated life of the CFLs are like six to ten thousand hours where a lot of these screw-in LEDs are 20 to 25,000 hours. So you might save more on maintenance than on, um, than on electricity. And I'm really looking at these screw-in LEDs to be sort of a new workhorse lamp. Instead of getting like new low wattage dedicated LED fixtures, it might be better off just going with screw-in LEDs. And it's easy to fix and replace the LEDs down the road. You don't have to go back to the fixture manufacturer for replacement LED modules or replacement drivers. And even if you have to buy a new fixture, it might be best off getting a regular 120 volt one with a screw in base and screw and screw in an LED than getting a dedicated new LED fixture like a, a low wattage wall pack. So now we're going to get into the higher cost versions, okay? And this is usually the most important question that I get when I give webinars or seminars throughout the country. What is the best way to deal with 
you know, how do you want to retrofit troughers and other lineal fluorescent fixtures? And we're going to go more into detail with highest lumen fluorescent T8, extra long life fluorescent T8, T8 <coughs> T LEDs, LED light bars, and LED troffer kits. You know, again, um, this goes a little bit back to what we talked about with fluorescent. This gives you some pricing. And again, I think that high performance T8s are much better than T5 or T5HO systems. Plus, most of the fluorescent T8s are made in North America. Actually, most of them are made in the United States. Most of the T5 and T5HOs are made in China. So if you want to help keep our trade deficit down and help support U.S. jobs, is another reason to go with fluorescent T8s compared to T5 or T5HOs. And a little bit more um, on, on T-LEDs. You got to be careful. Um, the performance can be quite good, 100 to 120 lumens per watt. A high performance fluorescent T8 with a ballast is about 100 to 102 lumens per watt. But be careful with the T-LEDs with their distribution, okay? A lot of these shine most of the light straight down. So if you put a light meter directly underneath the fixture, it's going to look really good. But it could be too dim between fixtures or on the wall. And if you put them in parabolic troffers with parabolic louvers, you can even make them uglier than they are now because there's going to be no up light, and so the top of the fixture is going to look totally dark. Now, there's some that have 340, even 360-degree spread, so if you want to put them in suspended direct and direct fixtures, you can get up light and down light. So, again, the cost ones using fluorescent ballast might be $12 to $18, ones that have integral drivers, either in the tubes or separate driver that goes into the ballast compartment might be forty to sixty dollars. I've been seeing some closer to the thirty dollar range, but I'm a little bit concerned about some of their performance and their warranty from some of these companies. This is something I would appreciate your help with, and I'm serious. Um, they said that what say because the, the T-LEDs work on constant current, which is different than the fluorescent. They said that if you had a generic electronic ballast and a high-performance electronic ballast with the same ballast factor, that the, the system watts would be the same with T-LEDs, even if it would be higher with fluorescent T8s with a generic ballast. Um, I've also been told that ballast life might be longer with T-LEDs than with fluorescent T8. But um, um, I, that came from a manufacturer of T-LEDs, and I would like, you know, to get some other information regarding that. Now, some of these T-LED companies are saying, you know, we have incredibly high lumens per watt, uh, but I've not seen any documentation from the Department of Energy yet and there are some major concerns no matter the lumens per watt of using um, T-LEDs with existing fluorescent lamp holders and that will be discussed. Also if you can get really high efficiency lumens per watt with, with T-LEDs you could actually do it better with something like LED light bars LED tropper kits, LED troppers, et cetera. Um, for example, there is one company that makes both T-LEDs and LED light bars using the exact same LEDs and the exact same drivers. They got 12% more light with the, with the light bar. And one big reason is the light bar is screwed into the fixture housing and it uses the whole fixture as a heat sink to help keep the LEDs cooler. Now, let's say there's a fixture, a fluorescent fixture that's UL'd as a 
you know, as a fluorescent fixture. Even if the PLEDs um, are UL listed, you may void the UL listing of the fixture, um, which, which can really, you know, cause a problem. Um, like, for example, if there's a fire or something, insurance might not cover it. At least one lamp holder manufacturer stated that key lead, especially ones with internal drivers, might be too heavy and they will not warranty their lamp holders to hold the key lead. Um, one key lead video states that keeping, keeping the existing ballast in the fixture, even if, but even if the key leads will not use it, you should remove any ballast that's not being used. In a lot of areas, that's electrical code. So this really covers the different types of key leads, how they're connected. The top one is using the existing ballast, uh, but you're using the extra wattage from the ballast, and if, if, you, if the ballast is relatively old, um, people might have to get back up on a ladder maybe the next month, maybe the next year, whatever, and people are not going to be happy about that. But for some energy codes, that does not trigger code like in California, and that's when people are doing it there. Some have an internal driver, and which requires removing the existing fluorescent ballast and rewiring the line voltage directly to the lamp holder. Okay, and we have four minor bullets on this. One is a, a one major lamp holder manufacturer said, well, wait a minute, we're not going to warranty our lamp holders to have a continuous 277 volt or even 480 volt. UL has found a fire danger with some key LEDs that have, that are connected to lamp holders that only have one input jack, internally shunted one. And the next bullet is important, and I've seen this way too many times. To save time, contractors and end customers are not using the proper gauge of wire and the proper color of wire all the way to the lamp holders. So they cut uh, the wire between the lamp holders and the ballast, and then they're using a wire nut uh, for that to the power. And so um, that's probably not the right color and it might not be the right gauge, that's an electrical code violation. If an electrical engineer ever saw it, he, he could mandate that everything gets rewired. And down the road, if they put in a fluorescent T8 um, th um, that's not used to 277 volts, that could cause significant problems to that. Now, some of them come with external drivers, which are better, but you're still using the lamp holders. And some of the brand new ones, you, you buy it as a package with a specific fluorescent electronic T8 ballast with those T LEDs, but you're still using the lamp holders. Now let's look at LED light bars and reflector kits. So they, before I go any further, I'm gonna go with the last bullet. I really, if people want to go LED and want to retrofit fixtures instead of going with new fixtures, I think these are great for anything other than troppers. So for strips, hooded, industrials, wrap seal types, these can be great solutions. But if you have troppers, I really like the LED tropper kits much better. Again, you, you can, the driver goes in the ballast compartment so the heat is isolated from the driver and the LEDs. You're going to keep the existing lenses and louvers. These are five manufacturers that make these. Like the Cree one uses magnets. Now, magnets help insulation. You still have to screw it in, but it really cuts down the time and makes it easier uh, to do the installation. 102 lumens per watt bare light bulb, you put it into a fixture with heat losses and a lens, you might be around 90 lumens per watt. Deco lighting out of Los Angeles area, they have various types, ones for regular troppers, 
basket droppers, wraparounds, et cetera. Um, LED Living Technology, based in Pennsylvania. They also have a very good one. Redbird in Georgia, they have a 10-year warranty on everything, and you can actually buy these with optional lenses, so you could get the light coming straight down with cosine, bat wing distribution, like in the one in the middle on the bottom, and, and really sharp cutoffs, like for garages on the far right-hand side. Again, you want to usually get light in a bat wing distribution, so it's uniform lighting underneath, directly underneath and downward toward the side. So you could put the LED light bars not just on the top horizontal, but also on the angled sides and get a bat wing distribution from like an X pattern. And then Universal, the longtime ballast company, knowing that they're not going to stay in business just selling ballast. So they've come out with some LED light bars um, in, in, instead. I've already talked about the, the better efficiency of LED light bars compared to LED T8. So we've sort of talked about that. LED troffer and troffer kits. Almost everybody making LED troffers are making a similar troffer kit. If you already have the troffer, it's usually best to go with the troffer kit instead of installing a new fixture with dust, time, et cetera. These are just some of the manufacturers. There's plenty more. You see some of the big name companies, also some of the smaller ones. These usually have the best lumens per watt out of the fixture. Here's an example of Philips Evo kit. Actually, now they've increased the lumens per watt up to about 116. Some of these can install within, within five minutes, not just the Evo kit, but also similar ones from other companies. That is much faster than installing a new tropper. That's even faster than doing a fluorescent retrofit kit, especially if you're going to include a reflector. So, to me, and I used to do maintenance. I try to make sure you can get to the drivers and to the um, LEDs from below the ceiling. You don't have to lift up ceiling tiles. And it's amazing to me that the different manufacturers are using different strategies um, for their kits and their troppers. Like the one on the top, the Lithonia RT was available in a T8 and a T5 version for years. Now they have an LED version. They're using LED light bars, not T-LED. GE and others are using edge-lit LEDs, putting LEDs around the perimeter of the lens. And like on the suspended fixture on the right, they want up and down light for the trough where you just want down light. So you put high-grade aluminum foil on the top so all the light comes straight down. The Cree one is quite popular on the top, the CR version. They have indirect lighting. The LEDs are on the bottom, bounces up on the reflector, comes down. So it's low glare, but the problem is the driver is above the ceiling tile. They also have an economy version, the ZR series, which is shown. Fine light, which is based in the San Francisco Bay Area, they're using low-powered LEDs. We don't even need heat sinks. More LEDs at lower power is going to be less glary. Um, you can get to the drivers and the LEDs just by swinging the lens door down. Uh, so you never have to worry about going above. Cooper is using a new technology called WaveStream technology, sort of using this little plastic lens that maybe sits down three inches. It has little air pockets in it to it. But edge light LEDs, that the LEDs hit the air pockets and shines the light in all these different directions. Here we have one with edge lit LEDs, um, plan lead based in Seattle, Washington. Not only do they have fixed Kelvin, but they have tunable. Tunable means dimming and Kelvin changing. 
So you could go from warm white to cool white. And I'll be wrapping up really quickly, uh, just maybe two more slides and we'll get into Q&A. One thing about LEDs that a lot of people don't know is, I mean, rated life is based on L70 when it loses 30% of initial lumen, where high-performance fluorescent only lose 8 to 10%. So it might, with LEDs, if you have, if you don't do anything, it's either going to be overlit to begin with to have enough light when they get old or the right amount of light initially, and it's going to get too dim when they get old. So here is one example what acuity is done. Uh, on the left-hand side is with, you know, the normal. You use 50 watts the entire time. And as the LEDs get older, they have less light. But on the right-hand diagram, it starts off at 40 watts because there's brand new LEDs which are very bright. And as the LEDs age and get less bright, then the wattage is slowly increased. So even if it's a 50 watt fixture, you're saving 10 watts, you know, at least like for the first half of the rated life. So oh, I'm gonna have this and the next slide, then we're gonna call it a day. What's really important, you probably have seen this walking through offices. A lot of people have twisted out or removed some of the fluorescent lamps in their troppers above their workstations. Um, sometimes it's all the lamps, sometimes it's half the lamps, whatever. And a, a younger people need less light than older people, and if you're doing all computer work, you want less light. And even if you have a dimming circuit with one circuit, you're not going to make everybody happy. It'll either be too bright or too dim for different people. And I've done this where I found out that they went with LED troppers, even with dimming with one circuit, and it didn't work. So one solution is um, that both Cree and Philips have these smart systems with the controls and a TV wireless control, um, control that you could point at every fixture. So the younger guy just doing computer work can dim it down, give it to the older guy in the next module with a different tropper over his, and he can raise the light level. So to me, this is a good way to go. So, so the other stuff, you can look at, this is my contact information. Please do not call me before noon your time, which is 7 a.m. my time in, in a Y. And then we have a bunch of appendix stuff that you can look at later. Uh, one big thing is try not to focus on payback. It is just not a good financial tool. And that information is in the appendix. So we can do a Q&A uh, now for the next 10 minutes or so. Okay, Stan, we've got a few questions. Um, the first question is the that we can answer this question. In reference to the $10,000 saved at the MDQ building, did that include kilowatt savings, cooling savings, maintenance savings, and disposable savings? And actually that $10,000 is the kilowatt savings. Our overall energy program saved just over $150,000. So um, to answer that question, uh, we also got a question, is it possible to receive a copy of this PowerPoint? There's lots of useful information. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will send all of this information uh, within the next week, hopefully in the next few days, and we'll also post this webinar on the MDQ YouTube channel. Uh, the next question for you, Stan, is based on the cost of TLEDs and rated life, wouldn't it be more economical to buy a new LED troffer with a longer rated life? Sometimes when you retrofit, you have to replace lamp holders due to age. Again, and that's one reason that you don't need an LED troffer. You could go to an LED troffer kit, which costs less than the troffer and is quicker to do. Or you could use LED light bars that do not use the lamp holders either. Um, so there's an, and, and I got to tell you that sometimes you're better off with fluorescent. Now, LED in general will save you the most energy and will sometimes have the highest rebate. 
but it costs so much more initially than high performance fluorescent options. So for customers that have the money and are willing to spend it, sometimes it's best to go with LEDs because you will get the maximum long-term benefit. But if the customer doesn't have the money or doesn't want to spend it, sometimes it's better off going, still going with, with fluorescent. Um, I should be having an article uh, being published in Architectural SSL Magazine that will have more information on these kinds of things. But you can just do your own financials. But again, use something better than payback because payback does not include any benefit past the payback period. And with long life fluorescent or a lot of LED products, you're going to get more benefit after the payback than up to the payback. So payback just does not work very well. Okay, thank you, Stan. Uh, the next question, what is Stan's recommendations on using the internal driver TLEDs? By using the internal driver, you have to bring line voltage to the connectors. Does that mean the fixture loses it, it, does it lose its UL listing? Uh, it, it, you know, what I found out, it, it really depends on certain manu fixture manufacturers said it's okay, but I've seen, I won't mention the name, but saying, you you change this and change the wiring, you're voiding our UL listing. So if there's any problem, um, you know, that voids warranty, um, if there ins your insurance carrier probably will not do it. And it's interesting, too, one thing more about the LEDs that, that have line voltage to the lamp holders. Different companies are having different wiring. Some companies will wire just one side with power. Some you have to do both sides. So let's say you go with an LED T8 that it gets line voltage now and it's wired a specific way only on one side. And then down the road, they buy replacement key leads from another company, but it needs a different wiring. You're going to have to rechange the wiring to the lamp holders, which can really take extra time and, and money. So I guess you can tell I really don't like key leads, um, but I do have to say that if the ballasts are relatively new, that some of the ones designed to work with existing fluorescent electronic T8 ballast might be okay. But compare lumens, distribution, initial cost rated life with high performance fluorescent, both the highest lumen ones and the extra long life ones. Okay, thanks. Our next question is, so you, so you wouldn't recommend just waiting until you have enough to do the LEDs rather than waste money on outdated equipment? Okay, that, that brings up a really good point because some people say, I want to wait one or two years for LEDs to get better and, and lower cost. But if you do, you know, some good economics, if you wait, let's say, one or two years, um, you might never, the customer may never recoup their lost savings opportunity because they're paying their existing bill until they make the retrofit with either high performance fluorescent or LED. A couple years ago, I would say you might want to wait for LEDs to get better or low, less expensive. But now I think that LEDs are good enough and the price is good enough for people that have the money and are willing to spend it. There's no reason to wait um, any longer. And some people just love the wow factor of LED. You know, they go, I don't want anything other than LED, but I have some customers that still don't trust LED. LED. Some of these people got burnt when they got the first electronic ballast for fluorescent T8 in the late 80s and early 90s. They want to wait a while before they go with LED. So customers are way across the board. So I, I talk to them. What do you sort of want? Do you want the wow factor of LED? You want the best bang for the buck? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and get that input from, from them. Okay, Stan, thanks so much. That's the end of the questions that we have.
Uh, we want to thank you for your time. We appreciate that very much and your expertise. We also want to uh, just wrap this up. We thank everybody for joining us today. Again, we'll send out the presentation. Um, and also, if you're interested in the Enhanced program, please, uh, it's on your screen now. Check us out at enhanced.ms or give us a call. Uh, we'll probably have another webinar uh, sometime this year, so stay tuned for that. Again, thanks for joining us.